Show me a podcast with a bigger introduction than that, Ben. Uh, <laughs> At least this week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like the sweet sounds of Motorhead in the morning. Those poor bastards who actually wake up to start their week you with our show. Watch this on. <laughs> listen to this on Monday. Wakey mornings. wakey. <laughs> Banger of a song. Hands to off, our... Lemmy. <laughs> hey. Yeah, man. Oh, geez, that was pretty awful. That was That's a good way to start. Things. <laughs> We've got hundreds and thousands all over the desk. We do. <laughs> We do. Made the mistake of eating giant freckles while recording and already we're, what, 30 seconds in and there's bloody they, sp- sprinkles everywhere. They evacuated the top of that <laughs> chocolate block <laughs> like uh, like fleeing, you know, citizens of Pompeii as the, <laughs> as the volcano erupted. <laughs> like they just bounced across the table like, a, like the... <laughs> The feist <laughs> apple ad with the ball. It's <laughs> so weird that you said that because I watched Into the Inferno last night. Oh, did you? <laughs> I did. I thought you were going to say, I watched Pompeii with Kid Harrington. <laughs> I discovered new freckles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that, that is a banger of a song. Hellraiser by Motorhead. It's uh, that's a music video that was directed by Clive Barker. Did you know? I didn't know that. No. I know. This is actually, though, as you sort of alluded to a moment where we should probably pay tribute to the late, great Lemmy. Not only a... a <laughs> British heavy metal icon, but the guy that's synonymous with horror movies, he's in um, what Richard Stanley's Hardware, he's in Tromeo and Juliet, yeah, a few, quite a few Tromeo movies. Tromeo movies. He's a big my, fan of Tromeo. The, the biggest mystery for me, though, he's the bard. He's the bard. In I Tromeo know. And Juliet. But the biggest mystery to me is how the fuck he ever managed to shave around those massive moles on his face. <laughs> <laughs> that's something my sister has asked me before. She goes, "How do you shave around like, you know, <laughs> yeah. those, you know?" Yeah. For some reason, the razor just doesn't cut them. Like it's not like any kind of, uh, it's not any skill on the on the part of the shaver. Well, did you know that that Lemmy's moles have a Facebook page of their own? No, I didn't know that. <laughs> they do. Call me when they get an Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, that's a bit of a distraction. I should probably uh, welcome everybody to the show. It's Good Movie Monday. We are the podcast dedicated to nerdy cinematic ramblings. My name is Glenn Cochran. My co-host over there is Ben Helwig. And this week we are talking all about the work of Clive Barker uh, with a little bit of an emphasis on Hellraiser 3 because it is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. So uh, we thought we'd do something special for for that occasion. And uh, this week we have on the show a special guest, none other than Peter Atkins, who not only the guy who, who wrote Hellraiser 2, 3 and 4, but he's a lifelong friend. In fact, a childhood friend of Clive Barker's. So, you know, it's the closest thing we could get to the actual Clive, mate. <laughs> Frank wasn't available. <laughs> Coming up shortly, though, he's going to spend half an hour chatting with me about his work and friendship with Clive. And it's a really, really fun conversation. So stick around for that. That's what you're here for. <laughs> I was going to say, that's, that's such an odd thing to say. I just can't imagine anything with Clive Barker being fun. <laughs> Like, his, his work does not scream, like, hey, I'm a wild and crazy guy. Hey, his young adult fantasy novels are pretty fun, The Thief of yeah. All Ways. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, what else have we got? So this week we do have The Misfits along for another show. Guillermo Troncoso from Screen Realm is going to come at you with some movie news. Uh, Joe, Chad and James from the Bonehead Weekly Podcast are going to spend a few minutes on today's theme and Jarrett from Monster Fest will be up in a moment with a guide to what's coming out on physical media. Uh, and we also have a little uh, little special treat from Melzy Beg a bit later on too, so that's going to be fun. The ingredients for a good show, Ben. Strap yeah. in, strap in. I'm, I'm strapped. <laughs> I'm strapped on. Oh, shit. Ben, how, how about we spruik some social media platforms for a moment? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, well, what I'll do we pay got? attention to other things. We've got Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and we've got TikTok. We produce a shit ton of bonus content every single day, almost every day. Uh, we do reactions to movie releases. We do Lucky Dip movie conversations. And I also present a midweek late night video with Chloe Ritchie every Wednesday night at 10.30. So, you know, go on to our socials and have a look for it. And uh, that, that can all be found on our website too, goodmoviemonday.com. And actually, Ben... 
the weekend before last, you and I attended Oz Comic Con in Melbourne, and we produced a fun little Vox Pop video, which people should check out. It's been getting quite a bit of traction on the old uh, socials. You say fun. I got covered in nerd goo. <laughs> it was, it's a pretty horrendous experience if you're not a fan of that kind of thing. I, well, look, I am a fan of that kind of thing. <laughs> I just found that horrendous experience, like post, even pre-COVID, it, I, I didn't enjoy it. But post-COVID, being rubbed up against by so many people is quite disturbing. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's just, it just feels weird. I had flashbacks to, like, the Royal Melbourne show in the showbag hall, getting crushed almost to death. You know, yeah. it's, yeah, I mean, it was fun for me being there in the capacity we were with a camera walking around, snagging some nerdy conversations. But like, if I was there just to check it out, yeah, oof, oof, <laughs> I don't know how I could do it. It's weird. And it, considering that it's called Oz Comic Con, I found the only, the only stalls that you could stand <laughs> next to and take a break from all the people were the actual comic book stalls. <laughs> I mean, we talked to Pennywise. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. Like, but most of the people, like, even in that interview, I think, aside from maybe Pennywise, <laughs> all, like, all the rest of them, when you asked, he's going to spend any money? No. I, no. <laughs> no. Like, we're, they're literally just there to see and be seen. <laughs> they are the worst kind of people. <laughs> I wonder if they're listening. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> I hope the organizers aren't. <laughs> Because I was very grateful for the for the free ticket, <laughs> and we will be back next year. Oh yes, we oh, will yes, be we back. Will. And I would personally like to get to a few more of these kind of conventions, and just just for the sake of doing what we did, I had a good time doing it. Yeah. And if the numbers on our YouTube video are an indication, people enjoyed us doing it. Well, that's great. That's great that uh, people watched it and people enjoyed it. There you go. Well, and... well, okay. We don't know if they enjoyed it. We know we we know they watched it. And hey, maybe we have snagged some more listeners because of it. And um, in that case, let's <laughs> spruik our competition. So, don't forget, we've got one more week to go before our June competitions close. So, if you want to win some free shit, go to our goodmoviemonday.com website and visit the giveaways page. We have that awesome Cujo Blu-ray up for grabs, thanks to Dead End DVD. And we also have those other movie bundles, movie passes, and drive-in passes up for grabs. Heaps of stuff, Ben. Heaps. Riddled. Riddled with stuff. <laughs> hey, this is Jarrett, and welcome to PE Class. I'm going to start this week's segment with a little news. And that is that the unbearable weight of massive talent with Nicolas Cage is hitting home entertainment on August 3rd. Now, the good news is this one is coming out on 4K Ultra HD in addition to Blu-ray and DVD. Now, the 4K Ultra HD has Dolby Atmos, and there's also some special feature content on both the 4K and Blu-ray, being an audio commentary, deleted scenes, and even a Q&A from the South by Southwest Festival from earlier this year. Now, on that very same day of August 3rd, Universal Sony are releasing Firestarter on Blu-ray and DVD. This is the new adaptation of Stephen King's Firestarter from Blumhouse and director Keith Thomas. Now, you may know Keith Thomas from 2019's The Vigil, which is a really cool slow burn suspense horror for which the Firestarter remake is not. It's a breakneck pace sort of action kind of adventure horror. You know the story before. You've seen Mark L. Lester's Firestarter. I'm not going to say this is better. I think it's on par with Mark L. Lester's because I found Mark L. Lester's to be a bit of a plod, you know, it's it's a slow trudge through it. It's it's good, but it's not great, and nor is this. So the strength in this is probably the pacing, but in doing that, it's a shorter film and it skips over a lot of things. And subsequently, I don't think that this film or this story is Stephen King's Firestarter has been done justice yet. But hopefully in another 30 odd years we'll see another adaptation. But don't write this one off, definitely check it out. It's not great, but it's good, though instantly forgettable. Now in terms of special features, this one is loaded with special features and as such Universal Sony are billing it as a collector's edition. It's got an audio commentary, eight deleted and extended scenes, which include an alternate ending, a gag reel, and four featurettes. Now, also coming out from Universal Sony, though, at the end of August, on August 31st, is Jurassic World Dominion. It's coming out on 4K Ultra HD, Blu-ray, and DVD. And on that same day from the Studio Canal catalogue, Universal Sony will release a brand new 4K restoration of Red Sonja, on 4K Ultra HD and Blu-ray, of course, the Bridget Nielsen and Arnold Schwarzenegger Sword and Sorcery epic. 
Now on to this week's releases. What's coming out this week? Well, Universal Sony Pictures Home Entertainment are delivering Robert Eggers' The Northman. And the good news is this is coming out on 4K Ultra HD, Blu-ray and DVD. And again, Universal Sony are billing this as a collector's edition. It's got Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos on the 4K Ultra HD. And in terms of special features, it's pretty hefty. There's an audio commentary, deleted and extended scenes and six featurettes. Then also out this week from Universal Sony on all the formats, 4K Ultra HD, Blu-ray and DVD, is Michael Bay's Ambulance. Now the 4K Ultra HD has Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos and there are six featurettes on this. Mind you, Universal are also billing this as a collector's edition, but if you ask me, it's not really a collector's edition when you're just loading it with promotional EPK material. But hey, look, it's great that it's getting a 4K release and that it's got Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos. Then the last release I'll mention this week is coming out through Madman. It's Loveland. It's the latest feature from Ivan Sen, the writer-director of Mystery Road and Goldstone. However, they're giving his latest film, Loveland, a rather loveless release. They're only releasing it on DVD and it sans any special features. However, the US have released this sucker on Blu-ray via Lionsgate, but under a different title, the title Expired. Now, that's presenting the film not only in HD, but it's got a DTS HD 5.1 track. In terms of special features, there's just a featurette and a trailer, but hey, it's better than nothing. Anyway, that's it for me for this week, so until next time, stay physical. I loved Ambulance. That was a great movie. Do you enjoy that one? We went to that together, didn't we? No, no, I didn't go because oh. I had something else on. Damn it. And I regret not seeing it. What a banger. You know, I, I was going to say, I reckon that would make a great double feature with Wrath of Man. Like, they are just two perfectly matched movies. Yeah. You know, different sensibilities, but basically the same thing. Like, Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that makes me really want to see Ambulance. <laughs> it's a fast-paced movie, mate. I do like a fast-paced movie. You know I have very little attention span. <laughs> but we are not here to talk about Michael Bay or Guy Ritchie. Um, which, you know, I know you're, <laughs> you you kind of wish we were. I, yeah, we are neither here, of those two. Dare I say we're here to talk about uh, Clive Barker and things that are based on Clive Barker's work. Um, <sighs> we're probably going to get a little bit larger audience than normal on this episode, so this will be an interesting one to see uh, how we go. You're a big reader. I know that for a fact. Although, yeah, look. I have, have you read much Clive Barker is what I'm going to say. I only read, in high school, a friend of mine was reading, not Cabal, because that's Nightbreed, right? Yeah. He was reading one about, which it, when he told it to me, I was like, this sounds a lot like Dark Angel, or I come in peace, <laughs> right. because they were sucking out the, the like, bone marrow, the spine Ooh, fluid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And getting high on it, kind of thing like that was, or the open, the sucking out the spine, the spine fluid, open the gate I, to hell, I, or something. But that's I can't probably one of the books of blood. Um, well, but I no, I was, I am not. <laughs> I'm gonna, look. I'll, I'll put it out there right now. I am <laughs> not a Clive Barker fan. I, I, I did admit on the internet a couple of years ago that I had never seen Hellraiser. I have rectified that. I haven't. I've, I haven't. At that point, I had, I'd seen Hellraiser 3. I'd never seen Hellraiser. Um, and I've watched a couple of other things since then. Just They just don't do it for me. I'm just not into the center, the whole Cenobites thing. I'm not into the opening the gates of hell stuff. Like, unless it's unless it's Fulci doing it. <laughs> well, this will be a well-balanced show because I do love You love work. it. I yeah, do. I love it all. The first book of his I ever read was The Hellbound Heart, which is what Hellraiser was adapted from, and it was a very short book, um, and just a really good entry point for anybody that's never read his stuff. Because, and it's also the movie that, <laughs> sorry, it's also the book that I first associated the word spunk with jizz. <laughs> I didn't know, like I just thought spunk was like you are a spunk, you know, you're a spunky kind He's of guy. He's got spunk. Yeah, well, when this guy just let loose his spunk on the floor, yeah, I thought well, that's a that makes sense. It's kind of that word. <laughs> feels like it's associated there's with no that. spunk in the film <laughs> well they're kind no they do cut that out but yeah. the moment right beforehand <laughs> yeah. um and then just I, as he opens the box then i read uh i think it's actually when the hooks first hit him i think is when the that's sp- when he spunks that's when he spunks yeah <laughs> um and then i read cabal next which you mentioned was nightbreed um that's also pretty short um but the books of bloods where it's at for me that's sort of i think my second favorite anthology of horror film horror i keep saying films we're a yeah. movie podcast, that's why. 
it's my second favorite anthology of horror stories, probably next to um, Stephen King's Night Shift, which I spoke about a few episodes ago. We've done the we've done the two now. Like we're gonna have to do uh, like uh, what's his name <laughs> Ramsey, Dean Ramsey Campbell or Dean Koontz or yeah Dean R. Koontz <laughs> or uh... I don't know we could do an R. L. Stein. Yeah, Ooh, that'd be good. Let's do an R. L. Stein one. Try and get the man. Yeah, try. That wouldn't happen. <laughs> Just goosebumps. But of course, like Clive Barker, I think has a very unique way of telling stories. I think his horror is very visceral, and um, I mean, you put spunk in a fucking movie in a story, you know, it's. It's visceral. <laughs> he's just in, he's into blood and jizz. <laughs> he certainly is. I like the way he entangles sort of horror and fantasy. He blurs that line where they meet in the middle. And um, yeah, so let's get on with it. Uh, what are we going to talk about first? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You're the man with the notes. You tell me. <laughs> I got notes, but I kind of abandoned them a little while ago. But I was going to mention the fact, which I kind of did before, that his his work does extend beyond horror. He does fantasy as well for teenagers. Um, the Aberat series is a fantasy based series. It's not at all like his horror. So, you know, there's a little bit of versatility to him. Is there, there a barbarian in it with a big sword? <laughs> what <laughs> well, kind of, what kind of fantasy are we talking about? I mean, about? very similar to the dark tower kind of stuff. There's lots of crossover worlds and things like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> don't sound too excited there, Ben. No, nah, nah, I don't particularly care for that stuff either. But like for, for the absolute dedicated diehard, Clive Barker fans that are listening, I'm just going to put this out there. We're only going to scrape the surface here of Clive Barker adaptations. We do know that he only directed three movies, like we're aware of that. Um, but I reckon... You are. <laughs> well, I am not. Okay, movies. sure. But we're also going to talk about the movies that are sort of, you know, associated with. So you've got... I might even talk about Hellraiser Revelations. You never know. That's going to be to the ire of many people. <laughs> hey, Candyman 3 is a thing as well. So you never know. I'm a purveyor of shit, man. Like, that's, that's what I do. If everybody hates a movie, you could be guaranteed that Glenn Cochran loves it. <laughs> Let me just say that I'm as keen on the the Sunday market ripoffs as I am the original tapestries. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it. How about we get stuck in recommendations and you go first? All right. Well, look, on based because I, I, I was not at all keen on this episode. I was a bit disappointed when I heard that it came up because I couldn't care less <laughs> about Clive Barker. Never have and probably never will. Uh, <laughs> Apologies to Peter Atkins, who may be listening. Who may be listening. I'm but, sorry. Mate, I love you. I've got your well, poster. Not, your poster's in my office. Like, can't I'm deny not, it. I'm not having a go at him. <laughs> I know. I'm having a go at his childhood friend. <laughs> I just don't care. For, it's just not my cup of tea, man. No, that's all right. Um, <laughs> but 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 on your suggestion, I was I did I haven't seen it. I didn't know it had anything to do with Clive Barker. Yeah, and I've wanted to watch it for a really long time. Was Midnight Meat Train? Unfortunately, oh, yeah. the Boneheads who are coming up kind of pinch that one from me. Basically, and I just wanted to watch that because I love a, a Mean Machine, uh, <laughs> a Mean Machine horror film. Well, that um, too, and the fact that it's Bradley Cooper before he was, you know, the Bradley Cooper. Yeah, who I okay. yeah before he became Bradley Pooper, <laughs> Bradley <laughs> Pooper. I always I hated him too. Uh, <laughs> only like people once they become famous. But instead, I decided to, I revisited mm-hmm. Lord of Illusion, which I did watch initially sometime in the. In the late nineties, when it first came out, because I was a, a little bit obsessed with Fumka Jansen <laughs> yeah. after her uh, her uh, her, oh, her Oscar winning performance in Goldeneye. Yep, and the fact that she—I mean, I, look, that's the biggest travesty of the Oscars of all time—is the fact that she wasn't even nominated. <laughs> she she killed people by squeezing them with her thighs. That's true. And her name was Zenya Onatop. <laughs> She squeezed the spunk out of them. She squeezed the, yeah, they all... Spunk. She's lucky that she didn't get pregnant. <laughs> uh, but So I, I revisited this one on your recommendation. And I have to say, look, I actually did quite enjoy it. There's, I mean, there, there are certain elements that I couldn't have, you know, I could uh, live without. Yeah. And some of the kind of special effects-y stuff dates it yep. a bit. But it is still a pretty good... Uh, kind of detective noir yeah. slash horror film. That's like, why I recommended it, because yeah. I thought you'd at least attach yourself to the film noir aspect of it. Yeah, and it, like it, do, it does, it's very similar. I found it to, to be very similar to those H.P. Lovecraft, Cast a Deadly Spell type yeah. type movies. And it also, uh, you know, it, it did remind me of um, 
of that Van Damme movie, Death Warrant, when he's in the prison and they've got the, <laughs> the Sandman serial killer is in there with him and he has all those dreams Far out, yeah. of the of the guy. Um, the part that like the part that I don't understand, like the synopsis, the, the synopsis of IMDb, where they're like, you know, a private detective gets more than he bargains for. You know, does he though? Because his whole shtick at the at the start is that he is a private detective who takes on Satan worshippers and <laughs> it, the occult and the occult. So <laughs> I think he got exactly what he bargained for uh, in this film. He, uh, he is a character that is uh, in quite a few Clive Barker stories. Just so you know, oh, okay, Harry Demore, uh, and he. Um, what a great name. He's the lead in the most recent Clive Barker novel, The Scarlet Gospels, which is the sequel to The Hellbound Heart. And he goes to hell with Pinhead. Um, it's a fantastic... Like a buddy, a buddy road movie. No, it, it becomes, yeah, because he kind of um, somewhere along the line brings a humanity out of Pinhead and Pinhead decides he's going to bring hell down. And so him and Harry get together to do it. It's so weird. Yeah, right. It all takes place that's in New Orleans and that's where the gateway to hell is. Of course it is. Of course. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> Uh, in this one, it's Scott Bakula plays uh, good old Harry Damore. He's old enough to do an adaptation of that new one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the, the standout performance, I think, is is Fumka Jensen. She is great yep. as the um, kind of girlfriend. I mean, the, it, the plot twist, you can see. <laughs> like I'm, well, it's not even a plot twist, but you can see it coming a mile away. You know exactly who she is, like almost from the minute she turns up. Yeah. Um, Kevin J. O'Connor, who I've only ever really seen in Stephen Summers movies. Right. Uh, he has done a bunch of other stuff, but he's great as Benny in The Mummy. Yeah. He's great right. in Deep Rising. Uh, and he's great in this, although he doesn't get to do as much as you would like because of one of the twists in the film. He's not actually in the movie that much. Yeah. Uh, but when he is there, he, he steals every scene he's in. He's great. But the, my favorite, my favorite actor in this is Daniel von Bargen, who is the uh, the kind of evil wizard character Nix, who's like he's just like a character actor who's in a ton of stuff, and he's always great. He's in Malcolm in the Middle, and he's oh, in yeah, like of course I do know him. Yeah, yep. he's he always plays like a gruff old man, <laughs> uh, usually with a sadistic streak. <laughs> and in this one, he looks like a bum for the majority of the he... film, which is. It yeah, really suits him. Looks him. like a cross <laughs> between um, Lieutenant Harris from Police Academy and what's that Kirkwood guy from... Yeah, Kirkwood Smith yeah, from uh, like Fortress. A cross between them. <laughs> yeah, he would be a great Captain Harris character <laughs> had it not been... Uh, uh, oh, what's shit. his name? But uh, yeah, no, it's... it's pretty, who else is in it? I don't know who any of these other... <laughs> I don't know who any of these other people are. I don't reckon... Like, some of them pop up and you're like, oh, it's that person or that person. So this is one of the movies that Clive Barker did direct because he did this one. He did Nightbreed and Hellraiser as a director. Right. Um, and there was a bit of controversy around this one with the whole um, theatrical cut and, and director's cut. The studio didn't like the version he delivered because it was too heavy on the drama and they insisted he take the up drama the out and just put the gore in and whatever violence there is. And I've got both cuts on DVD. Um, I don't, rem- don't, don't remember. I don't know which cut I watched. I reckon, I, I reckon it's only the director's cut I've seen. So I should. Maybe... I only saw it on Tubi. It's whatever the version <laughs> is on Tubi. <laughs> I reckon that might be the director's cut because I think that might be the standard delivery now of that one. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, cool. I'm glad you. Well, so. Yeah. I mean, and there's it does take it. The movie takes a lot of leaps of faith. Like, I feel like this would be like another Silence of the Lambs where you read the novel and like. He's a private detective who figures stuff out. In this one, he literally just walks. He he walks from scene to scene with little or no reason between it, <laughs> and just gets the you know gets the inf- gets the um the exposition that he needs. Yeah. I'd be interested to go back and read the book because I haven't read it for the longest time. But it's one of his short stories from the Books of Blood, so right. I think it's only it's shorter than a novella. So. I know. He seems to have the ones he's directed have all been very short books. Well, that makes it makes so much more sense. Yeah, because movies based on on novels, they usually have to cut out so much that it, yeah. it barely re- it actually it upsets people who like the novels. Yeah, it's basically a a tr- when you've got a short story, it's basically your treatment right there. Yeah, um, and, and you I'll, get to flesh it out. Hellraiser, for example, is a one set piece. Really, it only really takes place in the one house. You know, so yeah. 
Um, Smart, I guess. Oh, I'm glad I'm just you. Like, I think I think of Hellraiser as the adult version of Gremlins. <laughs> it's just he goes to the place, gets the box, <laughs> then goes home, follows the, well, doesn't follow the instructions or does follow the instructions, <laughs> and then shit goes bad. Uh, I do love Hellraiser. <laughs> What's going on everybody, it's Guillermo here again from ScreenRealm.com, the website that has absolutely nothing going on because of the domain issues and the host issues and the server and all this shit. Anyway, uh, so there's not much for me to talk about regarding the website itself, but go to YouTube, go to check out ScreenRealm there, we've got some videos up. But I will tell you about a few news stories from the world of cinema, kicking off with a sequel to Joker. That's right, Joker 2 is in the works and it's going to be starring Joaquin Phoenix back in the role and potentially Lady Gaga, who's in early talks to star in the film. A few interesting things here, Lady Gaga is in talks to play Harley Quinn, and the film is apparently going to be a musical. Apart from that, not much else is known about the film. Oh wait, no, we actually know the title as well. The title is Joker Folie et Deux, which literally translates to Madness for Two, and in the medical world refers to delusion or mental illness shared by two people in close association. Stay tuned as that one comes together. New Zealand filmmaker Taika Waititi has given a little more information regarding his planned Star Wars movie. In an interview with Total Film, he said, Look, I think for the Star Wars universe to expand, it has to expand. I don't think that I'm any use in the Star Wars universe making a film where everyone's like, Oh great, well that's the blueprints to the Millennium Falcon. Ah, uh, that's true back as grandmother. That all stands alone. Waititi added, I would like to take something new and create some new characters and just expand the world. Otherwise, it feels like it's a very small story. Essentially, it looks like he's going to be tackling new characters in a new area of this galaxy, as opposed to the whole prequel and character digging that Lucasfilm has been tackling. Paddington 3 is coming together. The third film, focusing on the lovable bear, is going to be directed by Dougal Wilson, a music video and short film director making his feature directorial debut. He's taking over directing duties from Paul King, who was behind the first two Paddington films. This third entry is titled Paddington in Peru, referring of course to Paddington's native home. The film is going to begin principal photography in 2023 and will be shot in both London and Peru. Another threequel is coming together with Equalizer 3 and it's going to mark a Man on Fire reunion. Denzel Washington will be returning to star in the film and it's also going to be starring Dakota Fanning. So Fanning and Washington will be reuniting after approximately 20 years since Man on Fire. No plot details for Equalizer 3 are known as yet. Antoine Fuqua is returning to direct. That about does it for me guys. Thanks so much for having me once again. As always, ScreenRealm.com on YouTube. And um, hit us up on social media as well. Thanks so much. See you later.
Uh, the name of that song was Don't Save Us From The Flames by M83 from the soundtrack to Dread. Dread's actually my recommendation for this show, but I'm not going to talk about that right now because first we're going to have our little chat with Peter Atkins. As I said at the top of the show, not only is he a long-time collaborator with Clive Barker, he's also a good close friend of his. In addition to writing Hellraiser 2, 3, and 4, this guy also created the Wishmaster series with Wes Craven. And um, that turns 25 this year too. You know, when you told me about this episode, I thought you were talking about Scott Atkins. And I was like, the martial arts guy wrote Hellraiser? <laughs> like, directed some of the Hellraiser movies? Oh, gosh, I would love to get him on the show. I, um, I've approached him a few times. He's got his own podcast. Like, he should be all up for this. I did get hold of um, Isaac Florentine, who's you know, he's a you know, long-time collaborator as far as directing goes. And he was up for it, but then he backed out because he thought that his English wasn't strong enough. I'm like, but I understand you. Come on. Come on. What a bad excuse. Anyway. Arnie has a career. <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> yeah. English is... Hey, here's one that you might like that Peter Atkins also wrote was Fist of the North Star, which was an adaptation of the manga, directed by Tony Randall, who directed Hellraiser 2. So, you know, he's got some good stuff under his name. The whole reason for today's show, as I said, is to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Hellraiser 3. I have a poster of it in my office. It's a movie I love... And if you've ever paid attention to my social media videos and going right back to early episodes, yeah, I, I talk about Anthony Hickox a lot. He's a director that I do like. He did Warlock 2, which is also a poster on my wall, amongst others. And so you can imagine then what a thrill it was for me to have this opportunity to talk to Peter Atkins, a guy who I've respected the shit out of for 20 years. Um, so enjoy this chat. I think it's a great one. Um, and we'll see you on the other side. What started in hell that it came out of here. will end on Earth. Shall we begin? The masters of horror are unanimous in their acclaim. Spectacular, says Fangoria magazine. One hell of a spine chilling ride raised West Craven. Cinefact Mastique says it's the ultimate in fear. I am the way. Clive Barker presents Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth, rated R. I am in my element right now. Welcome to Good Movie Monday, Peter. How are you? I'm great. Great guy. Thanks, thanks so much for having me. Having you here is like me being a, a kid in a candy land. I love this. So <laughs> as you can see behind me, Hellraiser 3, I am a massive fan. Um, heck, oh, I'm a fan you. of Hellraiser in general. Like I'm one of those lone defenders of all but one of the installments. But when it comes to the, like, the real love of it, one, two, and three for me. Well, that's, yeah, the, the OG trilogy. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, like Hellraiser 3, though, is the, the ultimate 3 4 because you've got Clive Barker, you've got yourself, and you've got Anthony Hickox, and three names that I just love. Um, because if you can't see behind me, I love Tony Hickox. He's got Warlock right there on the wall as well as Hellraiser 3. Absolutely. Uh, so you've actually got a little Paula Marshall double bill poster there, right? Uh, as Paula was in. We have had many discussions on our show about Paula Marshall. Um, we all have mad crushes. Ah, I was going to say, you must, <laughs> you're, you're just, a, I, I, I'm not going to make any guesses about your age, but were you? I am 42, you my friend. When you, were, <laughs> you saw that was, are you one of those guys who fell in love with Paula in the late, because they're all yes. over the place. Yeah. <laughs> I will fight them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh. <laughs> but look, you know, Hellraiser 3 is turning 30 this year, which is terrifying to me. <laughs> I want to pick to your brain you. about that <laughs> in a moment. But first, can we like, just for those who are uninitiated, because we're not exclusively a horror podcast, so sure. I'd like to give a little bit of a history here. Um, your your relationship with Clive Barker and, and Doug Bradley goes back way before Hellraiser, right? Yeah, we're all, all three of us are from Liverpool in England, and um, they had gone to the same high school. I went to a different high school, but the drummer in my band was the younger brother of a girl in the, not quite a theatre company yet, but a sort of little wannabe arts collective they had going. And um, Clive is, uh, Clive's three years older than me, Doug's one, two years older than me. Um, so yeah, 1970, long story short, 1974, and we formed a very pretentious, very precocious, avant-garde fringe theatre company. You know, Clive was 21, I was 17. It was, um, but yeah, we did theatre together for the uh, most of the next decade. So um, the older you get, 
the less long seven years sounds. <laughs> yeah. But you but you know, when you're young, it's like your four years at high school mm. is a massive chunk of perceived time, even yeah. if it's not a, a chunk of real time. Um so yeah. So we went. So back. you were you were all chums long before he even thought about the Hellbound Heart, really. Oh yeah, yeah. Amazing. Um, yes, this was long before Clive had uh, written. Yeah. Uh, he was our resident playwright in this, um, as I say, this French theatre company, which <laughs> you know played to audiences of three or four usually. Mm. You know, and um, I don't think I'm telling tales out of school at all to say that Clive wrote the books of you know which made his again yeah. for your mainstream viewers clive became very famous at least in our mid-sized pond for writing uh six volumes of horror stories called the books of blood and i'm here to tell you he wrote that as a side hustle to <laughs> to to make enough money to because we weren't making money as a theater company mm. and he, <laughs> if he could support himself by doing a few little horror stories you know get a bit of money it would underwrite his ability to uh, keep writing plays for the dog company. <laughs> Little did we know. Oh my goodness! And like, and given that you were like all creatives in a live performance space, were you guys dreaming of movies at the time? At any point, we actually made a, like a lot of um, precocious little fuckheads do. We um, <laughs> we had an eight mm cap. This is. This is the dim and distant prehistoric past. You couldn't make a movie on your iPhone. There were no iPhones. We, we had a silent 8mm movie, uh, camera, sorry, camera. And, um, and then somehow we, we talked the local arts council into giving us a 600 pound grant to make another movie. And we bought a 16mm Bolex silent. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah, we were old hands at, at movie making because we'd made uh, the forbidden. Yeah, I, I think I've seen that. Like it's, it's out there on the on the internet somewhere. Eventually, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it was unfinished. We we shot it for <laughs> three years. You can literally see me. Uh, well, not quite hit puberty because I was already eighteen, <laughs> but I, I was eighteen when we started filming it, and twenty two when we finished. Um, and there had to be 30 hours of footage because we just kept going. <laughs> but there was a, a like a 40 minute digest release sometime in the 90s. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Amazing. And then like moving forward, like Hellraiser comes along. I think that speaks for itself because it, its legacy is ginormous. But then you came onto the picture with part two. Um, yeah. And you know, it's got to be one of the great sequels of all time, like let alone yeah, horror, but just of much. all time. Tony Randall directed that one, mm -hmm. uh, but he was involved with the first film. So how did you get involved like with number two when you weren't part of number one? Um, well, I, I, th I think because as ever, in, in maybe in life in general, but certainly in the arts, um, in music, in movies, in publishing, you just call the guys you know. You know, it's like um, Tony. Tony had been... Um, what, what we pejoratively call a suit. He'd been an executive at New mm. World Pictures, who were the American financiers of Hellraiser. Um, but he'd been sent over by New World to supervise the second half of the Hellraiser shoes. And <laughs> I guess Clive and Chris Figg, our English producer, um, found him not enough of a prick as executives go <laughs> to say, oh, this, this guy's got some good ideas. Um, and Hellbound was never going to be a Clive Barker movie. Uh, Chris and Clive, who at that stage in their heads were positioning themselves as Britain's new hammer, you know, the, mm. the great horror movie company from the 50s and 60s. So Clive was going to go off and do another project. Um, so they needed a, a writer and director. Um, for the record, they had actually approached somebody else for both jobs. Yeah. Uh, Tony and I, um, might, you mightn't have been talking to either of us today. Um, it, it was a, a, a lovely horror writer called Michael McDowell, uh, no relation to Malcolm. Um, 
And he had written Beetlejuice, which I guess was his biggest credit at that point, and was well known as a horror novelist, again, in our little mm -hmm. field. Um, and he was, I don't think they'd got as far as a contract, but he was, he was primed to write and direct Hellraiser 2. And then this is a horrible thing to, to, to give a break to other, he had a personal tragedy, like a right. significant one. Mm. Um, I'm very sorry to say, and he couldn't do it. So, so I guess in a way, uh, not to do ourselves down, Tony and I were the sort of the, the panic default. It was like, <laughs> well, we're going to need a writer. We're going to need a director. And Clive is, you know, well, my old mate, Pete, I did theater with him. He can write. Um, and that guy, the suit, Tony. So, I mean, I exaggerate for comic effect, but yeah. that was basically it, you know, and so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's actually, it's hilarious. It's, it's hilarious to think, exaggerated. I mean, that was that was yeah. the situation. It's hilarious to think that, like, you know, one of the gnarliest, most gruesome horror films of all time was directed by a suit <laughs> for one. And then, yeah, you know, because the thing is, he he didn't look like a suit when I met him. Yeah, because right. We, we each had, I'd done a, I'd done, I think, believe two drafts of Hellbound before they flew Tony over. Uh, they put us both up in London hotels. And he'd so he'd read my drafts and he was expecting to meet a pierced, tattooed, leather yeah. jacket, chrome studded, mohawk, punk prick. And I was expecting, if you'll pardon my French, some cunt in a suit. <laughs> and, um, yeah. and then we opened the door on each other and we were two 31 year old men in <laughs> casual clothes. And I was like, oh. Basically, we're looking at each other, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, that, so, I mean, so that's, that's... very unsuit like. Also, he'd be mad at me if I didn't say prior to him being a development executive, he'd been a visual effects supervisor. Sure. At, back when New World was still Roger Corman's company, which is a mm -hmm. beautiful horror pedigree, um, Tony had been hired by Roger to be visual effects supervisor. He worked with. Um, Jim Cameron and Gail Ann Hurd on Battle Beyond the Stars, for example. So, yeah. so he'd been a creative who made a sidestep into yeah. suiting, and sure. then and then we got him back. We saved yeah. him. Oh, so with all of that sort of context in mind, it only makes sense that you would then step into number three. Um, and I think the shift in tone and atmosphere between number two and three is as bold as the shift between one and two. Uh, whose idea was it to to bring the story to America? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, well, it, well, here's <laughs> here's the thing. You say bring it to America. Where did Hellbound take place? And it's not a trick question. Yeah. I'd like to know yeah. um, because if you remember the, the first movie, Hellraiser, obviously American financing, but shot independently in the UK. Um, Second one, American Financing, was shot at Pinewood, uh, the legendary Pinewood Studios. Um, in the first one, there's a lot of dubbing. Uh, so, like, I think you do see a London bus at one point, but most of the supporting characters have American accents. Mm. Um, so yeah, people have been asking this for 35 years. You know, <laughs> well, where does Hellraiser take place? And it's, you know somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic, you know, in uh, in England, America. And Hellbound, the cops have guns in Hellbound. Mm. So again, you know, it was shot at Pinewood. It's Ken Cranham, our mad scientist, you know, is clearly English. Um, Julia Claire Higgins retains her English accent. But the cops have guns. Yeah. And um, Kirsty's American, Bill Hope is American. Well, Bill Hope's technically Canadian, but plays in America. Yeah, yeah. So, so I don't know what kind of, uh, I don't know how much of a conscious this time we're setting it in America, mm. any of us thought. I think it had just osmosed into being America. Yeah. By the I put it this way, but there were four different, at least four. I've written a whole article on this about the, the six versions of Hellraiser 3 you didn't see. All of them very distinct, separate projects, separate chains of titles, separate stories. The one that happened, the one that you saw, uh, was the 
fourth one, maybe. Then there were a couple right. more after it, but then we came back to it. And th that was the one where, uh, unfortunately, Clive, although he came back when Miramax distributed number three, he could not come to terms with Larry Coppin, who ran Transatlantic. Mm -hmm. So um, during development, writing, and production of Hellraiser 3, Clive wasn't there. So that story was um, uh, a story co... I mean, I have the sole screenplay credit, um, mm. but the, the basic story, in the same way that Clive and I had come up with the basic story for Hellbound, and then I wrote the screenplay. Tony Randall and I came up with the story for the Hellraiser story that you see. Um, and I don't think we ever stopped to say, so it's officially in America then. It was, <laughs> yeah. um, it was. although um, the two, ob obviously we, we worked together and put them both together, but we it started with two very distinct strands. Um, Tony had had this idea about a decadent club owner who'd bought the pillar of souls that showed up at the end of Hellbound as a bizarre objet d'art. Um, and, you know, we, we knew that Pinhead was trapped in that pillar. And I'd had this idea of um, a woman reporter who was haunted by dreams of war because she'd lost her father in Vietnam. Mm. And shows how old the movie is. That, that our young female lead could have lost their dad in Vietnam. Um, and in some sort of click in my head that a dream of one war is a dream of all wars, um, suddenly she finds her dreams invaded by memories of World War I rather than Vietnam and meets maybe a ghost of this English officer, Elliot Spencer, mm -hmm. who turns out to be somebody other than who we think he is. Anyway, Tony and I had these two ideas, and uh, it was just one of those things where we thought, well, wait a minute, those are two halves of the same fucking idea. We've got a movie. Um, <laughs> so that was how that came together. So it was, we still had World War I and an English officer, you know, so Elliot Spencer's comes out, Elliot Spencer comes out of the English tradition, but it was set in well, we tried to pretend it was set in New York. We shot it yeah. in North Carolina. We we had I think two days, second unit, some, let's go. I don't know if they're in the movie, but the, the Twin Towers are on the poster of Hellraiser yeah. 3, which is always yeah. very strange. And do you know that the release date of Hellraiser 3 was September the 11th? I mean, not 2001, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was 9-11 and the Twin Towers are on the poster, so... <laughs> that's a bit of a downer let's uh, yeah. <laughs> let's yeah. not talk about um, that when, we, when we're celebrating this uh, i'm, this I'm glad you brought up the whole um elliot spencer sort of you know backstory here for pinhead mm. because you know you're you're fleshing out some stuff that clive barker hadn't even created when you go back to the book you know so yeah, right, did you, right did you feel like there was a real weight of responsibility moving forward on your own merit without you know using all of what he did um if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, um, are you talking about Hell, Hellbound as much as Hell, Hellraiser 3 now? In, well, in, yeah, that sense? In, in a way. I mean, Hellbound, Clive was sort of in oh, oh, yeah, to the story. Yes, but yes, whereas number came three. Up with the story together before. Yeah, yes. Whereas number um, three, he was not so much as involved. Right. In, I, I, was, <laughs> I was just trying to think, you know, at, at what stage I felt more. The good thing about. Hellbound was that Hellraiser hadn't been released yet when, when I yeah. first wrote it. So it wasn't like I had the pressure of, oh, I've got to write the sequel to a successful horror movie and one in which our old mate Doug is suddenly becoming the new horror icon. You know, along with the, we've got Freddy, we've got Jason, we've got Michael Myers, we've got Leatherface. Now it's Doug. So <laughs> that hadn't happened. Yep. I'd seen the movie though, so I, I knew I was writing the sequel to a really good horror movie. So that was pressure enough, um, but at least it, at least it wasn't. Uh, oh, am I going to destroy this franchise before it begins? <laughs> but with number three, no. I mean, obviously, you know, Clive and I, we, as we we said earlier, we were old friends. So mm. it's not like I just quietly went and wrote it without him being involved. I I did the moral duty of calling and saying. Are you comfortable with me doing this? 
Yeah. And, you know, God bless him. He said, I'd rather you did it than anybody else. So, you know. Um, so I don't know. I just, uh, you don't really think of those weighty questions at that point because we're all still relatively young men. The movies are still relatively new. It's just the next yeah. gig, you know. So yep. it's a perfectly viable question that you're asking. And looking back <laughs> retrospectively, um, it makes me wonder, you know, but um, you know, at the time it was just, well, you know, we've got a movie to make here. Um, but no, I, I want, I, you know, I, I hope that although it's definitely a shift in tone, it's yeah. a more overtly, it's more like an 80s horror movie. You know, it's a more, over, it, it, it feels more 80s. Hellraiser and Hellbound feel in a way without being too cocky or pretentious about it, it feels like their own little separate islands, you know. Um, Hellraiser 3, I think, still, I hope, feels a bit Hellraiser-y. Um, but, but I think more than those two, feels very much like an 80s horror movie. Um, yeah. I think it feels very time-stamped now when I look at it, sure, which, is, sure. which is a good thing. But also, it, it, it's got all the hallmarks of the franchise has begun. You know, like we are now in franchise world. Yes, sure. Yeah. Sure. And 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 in elaborating on that, I want to ask you about like Pinhead himself. It's the first time in the series you reference him as Pinhead. Um, right. Was that a case of succumbing to an audience that had already dubbed him that, or you know, did it feel organic when you're writing the name? Well, I, um, I always feel bad in these interviews because it's not like I go back and look at the movies. Yeah. So yeah. I so I might be wrong, <laughs> but yeah. I, my memory is that the way I that that was a very conscious question in my head and i think the way i dealt with it as so often is can we make it comic um in other words he's only called pinhead when joey terry farrell gets mad enough at him to throw the name at him as an insult hmm. is that correct i mean obviously yeah yeah, yeah that's script um he is pinhead throughout but i think the the first moment it's said in dialogue is uh is Joey saying it in a sort of angry, insulting yep. way? Because yes, he was he was Pinhead by then. It was yeah. it was a crew member's gag on mm. um, number one. He was lead Cenobite in the credits of number one. Yes. I I assume in the credits of Hellbound. Do we still say lead Cenobite or do we say I, Pinhead in the credits? I, I don't think. recall. I don't think it's Pinhead. I think. I think that oh. Hell, Hell on Earth is the first time it's actually been acknowledged. And Doug Bradley as Pinhead <laughs> in. Yeah. Sure, sure. So, well, you know, it was, um, Cl I, I can't speak for Clive on this because I know that he now claims that he, always, <laughs> he always felt slightly offended yeah. and bothered by Pinhead. Um, that's not my memory of it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. It wasn't... It didn't bother him. It didn't mm. bother him at the time. It wasn't even, it was so unestablished. This is, a, again, a Hellbound memory, not a Hellraiser 3, yeah. I'm sorry. But I think it'll make you laugh. It was so unestablished that Chris Figg, the producer, um, when, you know, giving me my, we're putting you in a hotel. I want a draft in three weeks. I don't want any dialogue longer than that. Oh, and, and Doug's character, um, um, it's Pinface, Pinface. So okay. in my first manual typewriter draft of hellbound he's pin face and then <laughs> literally when i handed those pages over to chris's assistant louise who became a great producer in her own right later um she said probably rolling her eyes at chris it's pinhead so um so we had to hire a typist to <laughs> to retype the script with pinhead oh, anyway. that's fun and that's um, funny <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so so when i talked about like you know i think hell on earth has a timestamp. i think i could probably attribute that more to anthony hickox than anything because he has a very distinct aesthetic when it comes to his films like sure. warlock 2 is a good example it's got a very similar feel to it and you've worked with him again on prisoners of the sun in 2013 um, did you like? Was that actually Must a working you relationship? Mention that, Glenn. Well, Must you? you know no, what? I don't. You know, I don't want Tony to bring I, up bad memories, but I, I have it on Blu-ray. I enjoy the film. Well, that's that, that's a miracle. But thank you. Um, 
I, I'm now doubting your taste and wondering whether <laughs> um, people say that to me all it, the time. <laughs> it had it had such a tortured history um, mm. for us. We wrote it. Uh, Tony and I, although he was brought on as a last minute replacement for Tony Randall. Um, it, well, it's, it's going to be a funny tie in, actually, with Prisoners of the Sun. Larry Mortoff in, you know, he claimed there were other reasons, but it was just a power move. He got rid of Tony two weeks before the movie went into production so that he didn't have a director who was long prepared. None of that was Tony Hickox's fault. He brought Tony Hickox in and Tony and I had some people in common, but we never met. Um, but I'd seen Waxwork and loved it. Um, Waxwork, sorry. Mm. So we got on immediately. And um, not only was it thanks to him that I stayed on in North Carolina throughout the shoot and became a Cenobite, you know, got to play the Bob Bar Cenobite in Hellraiser 3. Um, because Tony said, you've got you've got to let me keep the writer. You can't send him home. I've only had two weeks prep. And the producer said, we've got no budget for it. And he said, well, fuck that. He can play one of the Cenobites. So because they had a budget for an actor. So there's probably some poor bastard somewhere who would have had a job yeah. in, in Hellraiser 3. Um, but Tony and I, just as I had with Tony Randall, I, I've been very lucky with my, my directors. Um, he and I clicked. And yeah, we actually went on. We co-wrote about 10 scripts together. Um, none of which made it to the screen except Prison of, of the Sun, <laughs> which began life as a mummy project for the revived Hammer Pictures at Shula Donna yeah. Productions at Warner Brothers. Um, Richard Donner was going to be the executive producer on it. Um, Lauren Shula worked with us. There. Anyway, that fell through. But it kept getting optioned. It kept getting optioned. It kept getting optioned. And years later, Larry Mortoff, the guy who had fired Tony Randall and hired Tony Hickox, called us out of the blue. And this is such a, a cliche from movies about movies. He called me and said, uh, a friend of mine is doing a TV remake of the Ten Commandments. I'm standing on a set full of Egyptian shit. <laughs> you got any Egyptian projects? And I said, well, funnily enough, we've got a mummy movie. Um, and he said, send it over right now. I can have this set for six weeks. So uh, this was a good 12 years after we'd originally written it. So uh, Tony and I polished it up, you know, removed a few dated references, untime stamped it. Um, and then, and then Mortaf pulled the same trick. Two weeks before the cannon oh. fell, I had Tony Hickox. So it's it's obviously oh, a knee jerk move that uh, yeah. that Larry can do. <laughs> um, so, and then I, I have to. I mean, thank you so much. I, I'm glad somebody enjoys the movie. That that's great. Mm. we loved the script. We, yeah. we really it was one of the better ones that he and I did. But for for whatever its faults are, and I'm sure there were many, um, we structured it as a supernatural science fiction mystery. Um, and the guys that ended up making it, Roger Christian, who directed Battlefield Earth, no further comment, um, they decided that they would reveal the entire backstory of the mystery in the opening credit crawl. So to me, maybe not to somebody who came to it new, at that point, the entire movie, the audience is ahead of it. So it's like every time something happens, which we hoped would have been a, Oh, what's mm. going on here? It's instead of, yeah, right, that's that thing, right? Like it said in the, so, and they also replaced my chthonic <laughs> gods rising from their eons long sleep with the same old tired Von Daniken shit about aliens yeah. built the pyramids, man. <laughs> um, but it's got Charlie Chaplin's granddaughter in it. So that means that somewhere on IMDb, IMDb, there's some kind of thread of connection. If we're playing six degrees happens, of separation, so. yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't mean to take you down that rabbit hole, but I'm glad you kind of went with me for I'm a bit. Um, and we're, we've got to wrap it up in a minute, but one more 
little rabbit hole I'd like to jump into because Wishmaster's turning 25 this year. Another example it's of me It's a big anniversary old. year for me, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I connect <laughs> memories to this one. I was in New York City. I remember being in Times Square and seeing buses drive by with Wishmaster all over them. Like, you know, it's Really? It's those, absolutely. And that's where I first knew about it because it said, Wes Craven Presents. I'm a horror kid. I'm like, I, you know, I adore sure. that. And so, yeah, that's my my Can connection. I, ask, like, I mean, I, I don't want to. How old were you when we, when you say horror kid? Uh, a teenager. I'm, I'm 42 14, now. 15, so. 20. Yeah, I would have been about 17, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Right. 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 So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah so um, that's that's like so that's like when I saw buses with um, <laughs> Palmer's carry on the side or something. Yeah. Totally. I think, well, that, no, actually, I was older. I was I was 22 by then. But yeah, no, I yes. We're, we're brothers in the same tribe, though separated by twenty years or whatever. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> but yeah, such good memories. And uh, the Hellraiser. I'd like to revisit for a Hellraiser conversation. I'm sorry, a Wishmaster conversation because that first film is a doozy. Like I just thank you, sir, for that one. Oh well, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. That's. Um... But yes, as I was saying, to wrap things up, it's hard to believe that Hellraiser three is thirty years old, but um, it, it holds up really well. I have it on my wall. Uh, it's not coming down anytime soon. Um, I've been waiting years to have a chat with you, so I just thank you so much for making time to have a chat with me. Oh, no, it was great. I really, really appreciate it, Glenn. Thank you very much. Good Movie Monday is made possible with help from Kaiju Beer. Unashamedly intense Australian craft beer. Welcome to Bonehead Weekly Fun Size. I have so many stories about who we're going to talk about today. Well, actually, I only have the one. I got to meet Clive Barker. I was really lucky, and he uh, we told him a dirty joke, and he ended up laughing and almost falling over himself. That's the short version of that. If you're at a Comic-Con or something, buy me a drink, and I'll tell you the full version of that story. Gentlemen, what are some of your favorite Clive Barker films? Now, remember, he only directed three movies. Yeah. <laughs> And there's just the three of us. Yeah. So let's w open that net up a little bit of stuff, movies that are based on Clive Barker. Well, well I got I got to talk about my one of my favorite movies of all time, and that's Nightbreed. I love Nightbreed. It's one of my favorite movies. Even as a, as a kid, seeing these monsters all live all together, it was just astounding to watch. And yeah, he directed it. And he wrote it as well. And uh, I'm a huge fan of the novel Cabal as well. I like the novel Cabal. The problem I have with that is the two main characters. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, are the okay. worst casting of all time. Craig Schaefer is not a great actor, in my opinion. No. Nope. Uh, and uh, and Bobby, I I don't know. Don't what even. Else she... I don't know why. I don't but know. It why. had one of the best villains of all time in movie history. In played David by Kramer. one of the right. Played by one of the great directors. I agree. As all for, right. Yeah, it's Doctor Philip K. Dyer. I just thought it was fantastic. Him him coming in and being that crazy of a, a serial killer and that mask still haunts me to this day i love the opening but that movie yeah i don't have an attachment to it i like scenes in it though i did i did it was just one of those movies that i happened to rent on vhs when i was a kid and just was ooh, all these monsters are amazing and it, it everything about it i just loved it i'm going to talk about a little uh, chad reminded me i was going to go with something but i'm going to go with something else because chad reminded me that one of my well, actually, one of the most brutal hoarder, hoarder, one of the most brutal horror films made in the last 20 years is Midnight Meat Train. In all fairness, he, Vinnie Jones hoarded. Yeah. In yeah, that movie, those those big things he cut off. People forget that this movie had Bradley Cooper before Bradley Cooper was Bradley Cooper. Leslie Bibb, Brooke Shields, Vinnie Jones, Roger Bart. Hell of a cast directed by a guy's name whom I cannot, cannot say. It was a Lionsgate picture. It set forever, and then they finally just dumped it. I think we saw it at the Dollar Theater, right? Yep, that's yeah, that's correct. Yeah. When it used to exist, that doesn't exist in Lexington, Kentucky anymore, but we couldn't even see that in the first run. And we all thoroughly enjoyed the picture. Oh, God, It's a yeah. really well-made movie. It is dark, though. It is so dark. There's bleakness to it. And there's really, forgive the pun, no light at the end of the tunnel. No, it's all depressing. There's it's not one depressing. happy moment in that movie. But it's a brutal horror film that people don't remember, they don't talk about. And if you've never seen it, I encourage you to go out, find it. It's pretty good. You can watch it on Pluto TV or Vudu. 
I'm going to talk about one, you know, and what I was going to say, so you talked about Midnight Me Train. Midnight Me Train is a great title, right? You know, yeah. you know, you're going to watch that movie and go, oh, I want to talk about another great title. I'm hungry three- now. I want the 7 p.m. cheeseburger line. Uh, the uh, George, is it George Pavlau? Pavlou? Pavlou? Uh, well, directed, I've heard about his dog. Uh, yeah, uh, directed two films based on Clive Barker. The first one was Underworld also known as Transmutations. But I want to talk about hit the second film he directed by Barker, which would be, of course, another great title, Raw Head Rex. Rex. You know, if guys, he, I, I've never seen it. Oh, Chad, he, it's got a great scene where Raw Head Rex just takes out his wank and starts pissing on somebody. <laughs> yeah, we got to watch that together because I've it's never seen bad. it. It's not bad. It's If you've never seen it, I encourage you. It's not. It's a solid creature feature B-movie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's it's set really? in Ireland, mm-hmm. and it's it's this creature get the lightning strikes the grave and wakes up raw head Rex, and he goes on to kill a bunch of people. There you yep. go, Chad. You go. I've given you the brief and summary. He, this of that. is on one of them. Well, yeah, I guess I yeah. never have to see it. Thanks for ruining it for uh, me, James. You bastard. Well, now don't worry. Uh, there's there's I won't tell you how it ends, but it's it, it involves a monster. <laughs> Can't help, Chad. I don't want to ruin it for Chad. I can't say anything else. There's a monster involved, Chad. How's that? <laughs> and with Jeez, that, you've had powerful. Bonehead Weekly Fun Size. Spoilers! Hello there. It's Melissa, Mel, Melzy Beg here from the Melbourne Horror Film Society. I could not resist the urge to weigh in with my two cents on a Clive Barker episode. Now, I of course love the original Hellraiser. It's an incredible film, and Hellbound is really great as well. Kirsty is such an underrated final girl, I think. But strangely enough, I saw Hellraiser 3, the first out of the franchise. It was back when I was doing my undergrad, and I can't remember what the topic was, but from what I'd heard about Hellraiser, I knew that was probably going to be a really good film to focus on. So I did my usual thing and rang around all the DVD shops anywhere near the north side of Melbourne, And all I could find was part three. So I thought, I'll stuff it. I'll hire that. And so that's what I ended up writing about. The lecturer must have been thinking, wow, that's very specific to be focusing on Hell on Earth rather than the original. But it worked. Anyway, Hellraiser 3 goes in a very different direction than the first two, which really tell the story of Julia and Kirsty. In a way that kind of makes me think of Final Destination 3, Hell on Earth ups the ante dialing up the gore and those winks at the audience as it really embraces the humour and fun aspects of the series. And even if you haven't seen this instalment yet, I'm sure you've heard about the CD Cenobite. So good. (laughs) Anyways, yes, it can be a little bit poxy at times, but it is such an enjoyable watch. Don't do as I do, watch them in order, but certainly don't stop at number two. Make sure you throw on number three for some good time horror fun. And guys, I shall see you back in the studio in a couple of weeks, armed with all of my notes. You know it. Happy Monday, everyone. Oh, how about that, Ben? A cheeky little recommendation from Elsie. Just squeeze that one in. Not only not only like a good movie Monday tribe member, but um, who would have thought that she would be a fan of uh, Hellraiser 3? Yeah, oh, um, it's shocking that anyone who's uh, uh, <laughs> one of the... Uh, one of the uh, the council of uh, the Melbourne Horror Society, one of the would be a fan of the of the Hellraiser movies. Who would have thunk it? Who would have thunk it? But thank you. You've just uh, said exactly what I was about to say. She is one of the figureheads of the Melbourne Horror Film Society. I was so. to think, she's not one of the founders, but she's one of the yeah, I'd say one, one of the managing directors. There one we go. The, um, one of the directors of the Melbourne Horror. But Film hey, Society. look, she did like a whole freaking what thesis essay on Hellraiser three. I give her credit for that. And before Melzy, we have the Boneheads. Uh, you can find the Bonehead Weekly podcast, you know, where everywhere you get podcasts. We all say that. Every podcast in the world says it. They say, yeah, because he could be a Stitcher, as a uh, Apple, <laughs> Spotify. Pod, Spotify. Is it on the, on the other one? The other one? <laughs> some of their recent. Pod, Podify. Some of their recent episodes include the history of Spider Man, unpopular Disney opinions, and ninja movies. Unpopular Disney opinions. I know. I haven't I listened to, listen that to that one that yet. Episode. <laughs> yeah, I do listen to their show. What's that? What, what are those unpopular? Like, I think the Frog Princess is actually really good. <laughs> is that unpopular? She should be white. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, it's my turn now to talk about the recommendation, and I'm going to turn the conversation towards Dread, a movie that was made in 2009. There was huge excitement about Clive Barker at this time um, because you had Midnight Meat Train, which you spoke about before, and then Books of Blood. They all came about within sort of a 12-month period, and it was a bit of a renaissance, and everyone's like, oh, you know, the momentum's there. We're going to get all these Clive Barker adaptations. And then, yeah, just fucking fizzled. Like, you got three bangers, and that's all we're going to get. Um, so Dread is, I think, the best of the three. It was directed by a guy called Anthony de Blassie, um, who also produced Midnight Meat Train and Book of Blood. So obviously he was the, the guy pushing for this whole... When did this come out again? Uh, 2009. Right, okay. So it was already... It was already lost ground because the excellent Club Dread had already come out. <laughs> the far superior and, Club um, Dread. But this guy also produced one of the worst Clyde Barker adaptations a few years before called The Plague with Jans Vanderbeek. It was a TV movie. I actually really want to watch The Plague. I just couldn't find a copy of it anyway. <laughs> I, I, I did have it at one point. Whether I still do is another question, simply because I at that point I collected everything Clive Barker and Cause that's a, saw um, the error of my ways at one point. It's like, a, it's like a Stephen King kind of something's wrong in Derry kind of movie, mm, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. But this guy, you should know, who directed um, Dread, also directed a Monster Pictures release, The Last Shift. Yes, and I spoke to him about The Last Shift. You didn't talk to me about Dread. Never heard of it, man. <laughs> well, this is a movie that was based once again on a short story from the Books of Blood. It stars Jackson Rathbone, Sean Evans, and Paloma Faith. And, I do like Paloma Faith, funnily enough. Yeah, and it's about two college friends who um, they're doing the, uh, a, a fear study as part of their final year um, assignment. And so what they're trying to do is tap into people's greatest fears by comparing how they deal with their fears to other people and whatnot. And they get carried away with it, or one of them in particular. Sean Evans um, has his own issues. It sounds like body chemistry without the, <laughs> without the erotic... The eroticness of it. Okay, well, the thing is, these guys, they, they have their own personal fears and traumas, which is what's driving the whole thing. Um, for Isn't example, it funny how all of these, in every movie <laughs> when they, you know, when they do the research into fear, the people running the test have their own. That's right. Like most people just are like, yeah, I don't, I don't. I don't dig spiders. Well, <laughs> but they don't really spend any more time obsessing I mean, about their fears than that. From spiders to Sean Evans witnessing his entire family being butchered by an axe murderer, like that's the kind of fears he has, um, and he he a, is the one that that's becomes a bit obsessed. specific. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And so all of the fears studies that like they do. Who isn't who isn't terrified of their uh, family <laughs> being killed by an axe? They're murderer. all aligned with trauma, and yeah, things take a turn when his obsession pushes everything into an extreme, and he kidnaps college girls and puts them through some really horrendous things. Um, one girl while giggling. One girl's trauma is that she was um, she was molested by her father in a meat packing plant. So this guy kidnaps her. Once again, really specific. Yeah, and she, the, the dad always smelled like meat when he was molesting her, right? So he kidnaps this girl, locks her in a room with a lot of meat to see how she reacts to it. Right. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about. And uh, Is it hosted by Joe Rogan? <laughs> is it, is it fear, fear Factor? factor? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, so the whole, the whole concept of the film is they're trying to trigger people's fears. Possibly the hardest moment to, um, to witness in this film, and it is really hard to watch, is a girl that's covered in birthmarks. Like she's got them all over her body and she gets put in a room with a bathtub full of bleach and she hops into the bath with bleach and she tries to scrub all of her birthmarks off with steel wool and the camera doesn't flinch. So you see her flesh coming off. And it's like really gross and repulsive, but it's also an everlasting image. Like I can't get it out of my head. And, and that's what I think of when I think of dread. And I do like a, a grotesque, gruesome film that pushes boundaries. So it's bloody horrific, but damn, if it's not a good one. And there you go. There lies my Clive Barker recommendation. <laughs> Dread, put it on your list. I think it's available on YouTube to rent or Google. Well, well worth it. Uh, and check out those other ones. Midnight Meat Train and Books of Blood. They're good. Plague. <laughs> I really want to see Plague. Good Movie Monday is made possible with the support of people like Viewlorium. Viewlorium is a streaming platform for rare and obscure movies, and it's absolutely free. They also have a catalogue full of kids' flicks, classic movies, foreign cinema, and more. Visit Viewlorium.com today to see what it's all about. All right, so final stretch of the show, Ben. Let's talk. <laughs> let's talk a bit more about Clive Barker, shall we? Sure. <laughs> well, I think, um, yeah. Look, Hellraiser was covered enough by uh, Peter and yourself earlier on. 
I will say that I do adore the the Hellraiser franchise in general. I think number eight is the only one I didn't like, which was Hellworld with Lance Henriksen. That was a piece of shit. But I'm a, I'm I'm the lone defender of Revelations, the one that everyone seems to hate, where they they cast a new pinhead, and he was admittedly fucking atrocious. But the the story itself was like a return. Like, how can he be atrocious? Like pinhead doesn't is not exactly like. Delivering Shakespeare. Oh. He usually says like three or four lines and then he fucks off back oh, to hell. That's going to rub a lot of people <laughs> the wrong way, isn't it? Because he's very Shakespearean in, in his delivery in, of, of lines beyond part one because he's barely in part one. Yeah. Well, <laughs> anyway. Um, that's really the only one I've seen. I am on the record. That I can remember. I'm on the record of um, being open about my love for Inferno, which was number five that Scott Derrickson's Derrickson directed. He's the guy that just did the Black Phone, that brand new Ethan Hawke horror. Yeah, which I'm looking forward he to seeing. He did the Exorcist, ex- Exorcist, the Exorcist of Emily Rose. He directed Doctor Strange, for fuck's sake. Um, and yeah, so Inferno, yeah, Hellraiser no, Inferno, no, I think. That's not a calling card I'd want on my resume. No, but he's, it means he's climbed that ladder and he's made it to the, the A-list, yeah. you know. He started um, off making shit Hellraiser films and then... <laughs> but yeah, you, you, so you're trying to find my trigger now. This is like Dread all over again. <laughs> <laughs> Inferno, You've got to start somewhere. Your Inferno first has Craig Sheffer in it and it's just a really cool Another. psychological film noir. It's, once again, it's very film noir. I love that one. It's great. Anyway. <laughs> I've, just got, I've got nothing to say because I haven't seen any of Outside of Hellraiser, Nightbreed is another big one for me. Um, I do like Nightbreed. I yeah, met Jarrett the... for the first time at the director's cut screening of that. Yeah, right. So that's how, wow. so that's how Fake Champ started. Right. Well, I had started it. I was probably a month into it. And then Jarrett came on board right after that screening. How did you... We met in the pisser. So I was... Like off, in the offer? I was off taking a piss <laughs> and Jarrett taking a piss. And he's like, you're the dude from Fake Champ. I'm like, yes, I am. And he goes, you and then you to- turned around and accidentally <laughs> pissed on his shoes. <laughs> we, did. we crossed streams. And um, no, he goes, you're the guy that interviewed Fred Decker. And I'm like, yes. And we hit it off. And within a month, he was on board he for was on the fake show. Champ. That's it. <laughs> so Amazing. There, it's a, it was meant to be. <laughs> I do have a lot of time for Nightbreed. You know, the, the Nightbreed inter- is the one that I've is the one that I've yeah. seen the most. Like the most. I, you know, every every time I watch it, I'm like. Yeah. And then the interesting thing about it, though, like as the Boneheads alluded to before, most people when they talk about Nightbreed, they talk about the monsters in it, and you know the part of Midian and all that. For me, it's David Cronenberg. What fucking scares me is David Cronenberg. Yeah, he's terrifying in it, right? Because that's possibly the first home invasion I've ever seen, right at the start of the film. Yeah, uh, it's, and that to me scares me. And they basically they rip him off. The, the, the Scarecrow is a re- total rip off of <laughs> yeah, him in that totally. in in the Batman yeah. in the Christopher Nolan Batman movies, yeah. not so much the actual his, comic. But. His mask is terrifying. Yeah. His knife collection is terrifying. But to me, it's when the woman gets slashed at the start and then the oranges roll across the floor covered in blood. Scared the shit out of me as a kid. <laughs> And then you've got the guy that in the psychiatric ward that peels his fucking scalp off, leaving only his face. Only his face, yeah. yeah He's I trying love... to get to the night breed underneath. I love that character. A and, real um, person underneath. It's a, such a gnarly... No, but Moonface is the one, is the <laughs> iconic, was the big iconic Which is, um, is it uh, um, Vince from, Nicholas or something? What's his name? Nicholas Vince or Vance? To, to be honest, yeah. I, don't, I don't want to even know. He's, He's the... just Moonface. <laughs> he was I don't the... want to know who the actor is underneath. I think he was the chatterer from the original. Did Hellraiser. you think that uh, that Neon Demons was kind of a Nightbreed? Which one are we talking about? No, not no. We're thinking of a different film. I'm thinking of Neon Demon as in the one with Dakota Fanning. Yeah, no, 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 no. I'm thinking of the the eighties. No, I haven't seen that. The eighties Neon Demons, where they they like they're in the park. Okay, I haven't and seen they, that. Uh, they're all kind of monsters who are. Uh, who just uh, you know, kill people? Yeah, fuck, sorry, not neon demon, neon neon maniacs. Right, yes. <laughs> Which is from that sounds more like it. Yeah, yeah, no, not not the neon demon. Well, I haven't seen that one, but I I know the VHS cover you just showed me, and um, I kind of want to check it out now. Uh, it, awesome. I mean, if if this show is good for anything, it's introducing us to films we haven't seen and makes us want to see them. From '86, so that's from '86. Yeah, right. So then, Nightbreed would have been what, '91, '92, 1990. Yeah, cool. When was but when was the short story written? Oh, no, short story would have been '80, '86 maybe, roundabout. Yeah, right. Yeah. Who yeah, knows? That's very interesting. It is very interesting. 
Hmm, what are some others? More, Night Breeze is a lot more complex than yeah. Neon, Man- okay. <laughs> Neon well, Maniacs is. I'm thinking of some others. One of the movies I think is probably the most, it's got the most integrity of any of his adaptations would be Candyman. I think that is a superb film. I think that's a really strong, it's more than just a slasher, let's put it that way. Yeah. Have you, you like that one? Kind of looking at me like, nah. yeah. No, I'm just not a. <laughs> I am. Um, like I, the I, first look, the fir- I mean, the, f- the first. That is the first one I ever saw of the, you know, say yeah. the name three times in the mirror. That, yeah. that, that, that myth, yeah. That, you know, the bloody Mary kind of myth, yeah, yeah. thing. And, like, it's just the world that they inhabit where everything is so dirty, like the, the slums that they all live in. Yeah. Like, why is it? It's. Well, I mean, I don't. You know me, I don't love social commentary in movies, but that one is a big one. Like that yeah. one does have a very strong social commentary that's not it is in the book but not the same because in the book it's Liverpool and Yeah, right. Which a, makes a lot of sense. It's a different class struggle, like, yeah. you know, it's not as culturally, you know, ingrained. And the whole yeah, backstory I didn't to Candyman that changed the uh yeah. the location. I mean, look, I'm a big Virginia Madsen fan. And that is why I, I watched Candyman. Yeah. And I think and, the, uh, the Liverpool story Candyman has yellow skin, I believe. But so is he a slave? No, he's not a slave. He's he has a, a, a rough backstory, but it's not one they really. Flesh but he's out. not from a hundred years, no, two hundred years I, prior, I like he's in Candyman. N- no, well, his backstory is obviously very different. Very I don't different. remember yeah, what it right. is because it's just been so long since I've read it. But I do kind of equate it to that American horror story, mm. the witch, the, the New Orleans, the, the Coven one. The yeah. Um, one yeah, they took a lot of cues. Very, <laughs> very kind of similar. Um, I I agree with James and um and Joe about Rawhead Rex. I really think that's a better film than than history will tell us. Like you know, kind of it has a reputation for being a schlocky kind of movie, but take away the the bad monster <laughs> makeup, like a, the, the, yeah. the the suit. The actual movie is shot really well. It's got a really great feel to it. It's one of those sort of you know on the moors type of um British horror films, almost folk horror, really. Which I do like. It. Yeah. So, don't, don't walk the moors at night. What'd you say? You heard me. <laughs> I enjoy that one. So, Rawhead Rex for the win, yeah. <laughs> and of course, um, what else? We've got some really schlocky sort of um, television ones that aren't worth mentioning. He's done some video games and comic books and all that kind of stuff. But Books of Blood, I've I mentioned a few times. I do remember that, that when Marvel had that, Marvel had a kind of paranormal imprint for a while with a Clive Barker. Yeah, uh, series. I know. Yeah, you know, I don't remember what the series was called, but he did video games like Jericho and things like that. But um, yeah. Well, anyway, some of his uh, stories have been adapted into anthologies like Tales from the Dark Side, Masters of Horror. Mick Garris did Quicksilver Highway, which was one of the stories was his. I wasn't a fan of that one, to be honest with you. Uh, Saint Sinner, another telly movie he did. That was the comic. Ah, uh, yeah, that it was, was, a, Saint was, a, that was a Marvel one, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there you go. Anyway, I've exhausted. Clive Barker for this episode. It's not the in-depth dive that you know the fans will want. But should have got Jared on for this episode. God, is he a fan? And though? I should have done PE class. <laughs> well, you know the thing is, we we have um, you know in various other ways covered Clive Barker quite extensively on FakeShamp.net and Good Movie Monday. So um, I just wanted an excuse to talk to Peter Atkins, man, and I got it. Talking to a childhood hero. Anyway, I want to thank some people. Do you have anything you want to add? Because, you know, you, you've mentioned that you like to sit back for the rest of this show. But yeah, no, I've got nothing. <laughs> All right. Thank you to everybody involved. Jarrett, Gamo, Joe, Chad and James, as well as Chloe, Sam, Malzi and Tia, who do help us with some bonus content and all that kind of stuff. Huge thanks again to Peter Atkins. What a legend. And for everybody listening, thank you. Don't forget those social media pages. Follow us. Um, like, share, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. Going to leave you with a song. From Nightbreed. This one is sung by the actress Anne Bobby. It's uh, Johnny Get Angry. Ricky, Ricky Bobby's sister. <laughs> Tell her they good night. I'll see you later, Ben. Have a good one, everybody. Johnny, I said we were through Just to see what he would do You stood there and you hung your head Made me wish that I would die Every time you do